time I welcome John Mark to do his solo. If you would, John Mark, come and sing us a solo at this time. No? Is that not on the schedule? Looking a little nervous. Looking a little nervous. Oh, that's good. That's good. There we go. What you got now? All right. Let me fix my collar. If you would, as I fix my collar, turn to Ephesians chapter 5. And we'll be looking at verses 15 through 21 this morning. Ephesians chapter 5, 15 through 21 this morning. Mm-hmm. Got a lot of paper up here. A lot of paperwork. Ephesians 5, 15 through 21. Allow me to read that for you. Paul writes to the churches at Ephesus, Pay careful attention then to how you walk, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making music with your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. Let's pray together. Lord, continue to receive our worship. We do come here with faithful hearts, hearts filled with joy. We are blessed by you. We are blessed with life. We are blessed with eternal life. Given to us by your precious son Jesus. That though he was without sin. He died a sinner's death on behalf of us. And so we rejoice in him. Receive this truth. And know that though he died he is alive. And so we are a church founded on the resurrection of Jesus. We preach and proclaim this. This is the theme of our song. And Spirit, guide us along as we worship you now through preaching. We want to receive the words of Christ and do it in a way that brings you happiness. That we do it by faith. That we have a great resolve to do what it says. That we do not grieve you. Be with me as I proclaim. Be with all of us as we listen. Protect us from the evil one. Let him have no disruption here. This is your sacred time. And let us just bask in it. We say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. If you ever get the chance, if you have a free Saturday, you need to go watch a few of our upward basketball games. They're very fun. It's awesome to watch all the kids play and they get super pumped, get excited, swatting at each other, rolling around on the floor. We just have a good time. But also what's exciting to watch is the parents. Uh, if your parents here this morning, I'm not picking on you. I just know it's almost just as exciting to watch the reaction of the crowd as well. That they take it pretty seriously. They'll shout, they'll cheer, they'll do all what fans normally do when you go to a game. But all that intensifies when the time is running out. Do you ever notice that? That's true of any game, whether you go to an upward game or if you go to a professional level ball game, whether it's basketball, baseball, or whatever. And so as the time is running out on Saturdays, you'll see the parents stand up, You'll see them get excited. They'll start yelling at their kid, 10 seconds, shoot, hollering at each other. And the reason being is because they know there's not a lot of time left. And once the clock runs out, that's it. The game is over. Whether you win or lose, you can't go back in time. You can't gain more time. That once time is out, that's it. That's what I want to talk about this morning. Is the preciousness of time. 
And again, we all seem to know this intuitively. Deep down we know that we only have a short amount of time here on earth and that we ought to use it wisely. Like I said, we know it intuitively. All we have to do is go watch a game and see people freak out when there's only 15 seconds left in the game. Time is precious. And there is much we are able to control in our lives. Time is not one of them. When it is gone, it is gone. So how are we, according to this morning's text, to be spending our time? How are we to be good stewards of our time? So we are talking about stewardship specifically and how we use our days, our hours, our weeks, our months, our lives. And so there are two points I'm going to be looking at. Point number one, I want to talk about a wise use of time. What does the Bible consider a good use of your time? A wise way to spend the days. And then I want to talk about a spirit-filled use of time. What does it look like when the spirit is working among us? And he's always working. Jesus said that in John 16, that I send the Holy Spirit to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He's always at work in the world doing these things. And so we're going to be talking about a wise use of time and a spirit-filled use of time. Here comes the quote that I like to have in every sermon. Ralph P. Martin, he says this, the Christian stewardship of time as God's, and pre- God's precious and priceless commodity is the simple teaching here, talking about the text in question, with a call to invest our energies and occupations which are worthwhile. So if we are not masters of time, that is we cannot control it, we can't rewind, we can't fast forward, we're simply at the mercies of time, Who then, therefore, is the master of time? God, that's right. God is the master of our time, and therefore, he dictates as to how you should use your time. And that it is a precious commodity, a gift given to us, and we should not take that for granted. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, which I believe is the heart of Ephesians, I think this is the key passage. It says, Therefore I, the prisoner and Lord, urge you to walk worthy of the calling you have received, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Much of what Ephesians is about is about walking a certain way. Walking worthily. That there are certain truths, chapters 1 through 3, that are awesome, but how do we live or practice these truths, which is 4 through 6. This is where we're at now. How are we to walk? How are we to use our time? So what is a wise use of time? Let's look at verses 15 through 18, okay? Listen to the words of God. Paul writes to the church, Pay careful attention then to how you walk, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time, because the days are evil. So don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living. And we'll stop right there, but then he segues to the admonition that we are to be filled by the Spirit. So a wise use of time. Paul calls for the Ephesians to wake up and pay attention. Pay attention to what? Well, this city really is in the heart of of a very pagan culture. Ephesus was a port city in modern day Turkey and there they boasted one of the seven wonders of the world, the Temple of Diana. And that this was where a lot of people flocked to do a lot of sinful and debaucherous behavior. And so temptation and darkness was around every corner. And this is why Paul is saying to be mindful as to how they walk. Pay attention. Don't walk in darkness, but walk in life. And of course, walk is simply a figure of speech on how you live. 
that he's saying you need to be careful how you live, especially the kind of environment you are in, Ephesians, that there is temptation, there's all sorts of reckless living, sexual immorality around you. You need to pay attention. Do you think much has changed? I, I think the temptation has been intensified. I think it's easier now to divulge in certain wicked pleasures. And so all the more reason we need to heed the words of Paul. That we got to wake up, pay attention on the how we walk. And that we are to, and this is what he says, making the most of the time because the days are evil. Now that was true then, that's true today, and always will be. Until Christ returns, that we live in hard times times. And so we are to make the most of the time, or some translations even say redeem the time. Who has that word in their translation? Redeem the time. This idea of purchasing back, taking back because the days are evil. And what is Paul saying is that he wants them to take every advantage to grow in Christ and be obedient to his will. Think of it this way. All right, she's here. I'll pick on my wife. That's what pastors do. We always pull our families into our sermon illustrations. Black Friday comes around, and you better believe that every store is going to have the best sales that you could ever dream of. That you get a large Roku TV for like a dollar. All right, that might be a bit of an exaggeration, but you know what I mean. That there's always great deals, but here's the thing. These great deals only exist within what? A time frame. You only have X amount of time to take advantage of the situation, get in line, elbow some other people in the face, so that you can get that very cheap television. See, what you did is that you redeemed that time. You redeemed that television in that short time frame that was given to you. You took advantage of it, Janie. I don't complain when the big TVs come home. In fact, I just scoot everyone out of the room and let me hug and cry over it. It's so beautiful. And so we are to take advantage of what is thrown in our laps, opportunities that are there, to be mindful, to pay attention when these opportunities come. And when we do, we jump on them. We redeem the time. We don't waste our time. Because, as we'll talk about tonight in the school of ministry, very sobering fact, is that we only have so many days on this earth. We only rotate around the sun so many times in our lives. And so we got to be careful that we are not wasting our time. Stewardship is vital. He wrote in the book of Colossians, Colossians 4, 5, Paul says this, Act wisely toward outsiders, making the most of the time. In other words, be careful how you walk then. What kind of light, fragrance are we giving off? Are we leading people to Christ with our behavior? Or are we just jumping in on board with them? And if we are, then we're wasting our time. That's living unwisely. Paul elaborates in both the proper and improper use of time. He says first you can use it unwisely. He says don't do it wise and not as an unwise people, he says. You can waste it away. Maybe spending large amounts of time on social media, television watching, and other thoughtless activities, not prioritizing godly things before other things. We screech and howl to make sure a ball makes it in the hoop before time runs out. We'll curse the television if we suspect the referee robbed our team of precious seconds with a stupid call. We will do that. We will talk about it for days. Did you see that call? Did you see how whatever? But we'll never flinch at the idea if we are neglecting our godly duties. We're we're more concerned about making a ball connect with a bat. And make sure 
And I know this to be true because one of the first articles I read this morning was the new rule in the Major League Baseball about the time clock, the pitching time clock. That there was a team that actually, or there was two teams that were playing, I believe it was the Red Sox and the Braves, bottom of the ninth, bases loaded, and a guy was struck out not because he missed the ball but because the clock ran out. In other words, the game resulted in a tie because the clock ran out and that made news. Time is running out. And we got to make sure our games continue to play. Second, they are to avoid foolishness and meditate on God's will. More will be said on this later. But the will of God is not discovered through mystic means, but feasting upon God's word. I know what God's ultimate plan is for humanity. It's not a secret to me. I know what he wants me to do as a Christian. I'm not in the dark about that. I don't have to buy some self-help guru book telling me about the meaning of life. I know what God wants of me, what he wants to do with all creation. I know where history is going. And you know how I know that? I've read God's word. He has revealed it to all of us. And so we got to make sure that we are meditating on God's word and avoid foolishness. And finally, he counteracts the pagan culture by addressing drunkenness. This, Paul says, leads to reckless living. In fact, I would argue he's doing this in opposition to being filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't be filled with wine, rather be filled with the Holy Spirit. And again, in this culture, they had the God of Bacchus that they celebrated. And he was the God of wine. And they love drunken parties and things that like that that I don't want to get in too detailed. But Christians are to avoid that drunken lifestyle. But rather they are to stand out in their purity, in their holiness. What sets us apart from the world is not us finding ways that we're like them, but to demonstrate to them why we are different, why we are set apart, why we are holy. The world will call us prudes. Sometimes even people in the church will call you a legalist just because you take the words of Christ seriously. But St. Peter anticipated this name calling. He says in 1 Peter 4.4, 4, They, speaking of the fallen world, are surprised that you don't join them in the same flood of wild living. And they slander you. Your lifestyle is so vastly different from you, it, from the world. It's shocking to the world. What do you mean you don't look at adult material online? No, I don't. What do you mean you don't watch all these shows with all this, this, and that? No, I don't. What do you mean you don't go to this place, flirt with this person at the office of things? No, I don't. Well, you must be prude. You must be one of those Jesus freaks. I guess I am. I don't care. And again, Peter anticipated this, saying, they will slander you, shocked by you, and slander you. You know, I always think it's amazing, any time a Christian school is put in the paper because they took a stand on homosexuality. That's newsworthy. Do you realize that? That the world is sitting there saying, hey, extra, extra, Christian school actually honors Christian teachings. Shocking. Right? McDonald's sells burgers. Well, yeah. Why is that shocking to the world? Because they want you to be like them. And when you refuse, ah, then we'll put you in the headlines and make the world scorn you and hold you into contempt. Paul says, no, pay careful attention then to how you walk. That you are not to be drunk with wine. You are not to be going to these temples. You are not to be going to these parties. You are not to be living the way that you once lived, but you have been transformed. You are not to give in to reckless living or drunkenness. Matthew Henry elaborates on the dangers of drunkenness. He says this, Drunkenness is a sin that seldom goes alone. 
Listen to this. Drunkenness is a sin that seldom goes alone, but often involves men in other instances of guilt. It is a sin very provoking to God and a great hindrance to the spiritual life. The apostle may mean all such intemperance and disorder as are the opposite to the sober and prudent demeanor he intends in his advance to uh, redeem or in his advice to redeem the time. See, again, drunkenness and giving yourself over to the bottle usually leads to other sins. Usually does. And so Paul warns against it. To be drunkenly filled with wine leads to a poor witness before unbelievers and results in reckless living that results in fuzzy-headed thinking. And therefore, you cannot properly understand God's will. So to recap, unwise living is a waste of your time. To be foolish is to be ignorant of what God wants for you and the church. I remember the first time I ever got a D after high school. I went to Bible college and I went to seminary. High school, don't ask me about my grades then. Okay, I barely pass. But once I got to Bible college, A's and B's. Seminary, A's and B's for the most. Except one class. I got a D. And it wrecked me. And interestingly, it was in Christian ethics. So I'm not too good at it. Anyway, and so I had a hard time with that class. And not only did I have a hard time with the class, I was also working at Blockbuster. Blockbuster Video, you remember those? It's like one left in the United States now. I worked there, and what was required of me is that I had to watch five movies a week. And also I had to use their Blockbuster online, which resulted in more movies per week. And they wanted you to be well versed in the new releases, all movies in general, so that when people come in and ask advice, you can say, you need to watch this. I was watching so much TV, watching so many movies, I was getting to the point I was watching things like South Korean sitcoms. I was running out of stuff. And the problem was, it was getting in the way of what? My studying, my classes. And so ethics is a hard class, very challenging. And Dr. Lederbach did not have any leniency. And I went up to him and I said, Dr. Lederbach, I never, ever had a D in any of my other courses or anything like that. Can can you explain this to me? And he was like, sure. And we sat down and he said, well, your last paper was pretty shoddy and you failed your last exam. He's like, if it wasn't for the fact that you had A's up to those things, you wouldn't have it. You would, you barely got a D now. And he's like, clearly, you didn't know the material. And I went home and I knew what happened. I had wasted my time. See, I did not know the expectations of the professor because I was unfamiliar with his lessons. I did not know what his desires, his intentions were for me as a student. Therefore, I stumbled and barely passed the class. When was the last time that you really sat down and humbled yourself to the Word of God to use a great deal of time so that you can know the will of God? So you can't know what God's expectations are for you what his wills and desires are for you if you are ignorant of God's word. When was the last time you shared your faith, talked to someone about Jesus? I do, I remember clearly. Prayed with your family, served at church, not attend church, but active in church. When was the last time? How are you using your time? See, this calls us all to sit down and sit there and say, looking at your calendar, looking at your habits, and say, how can I discipline myself, not waste time, but redeem the time. Not walk in darkness, but in light. Not be wise, but know the will of God. Not to be drunken, but rather to be filled with the Spirit. So let's move on to the second point. A Spirit-filled use of time. Let's look at verses 19 through 21. The end of verse 18, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled by the Spirit. 
19 through 21. Elaborates. What does that look like? Speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making music with your hearts to the Lord, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. And then it talks about what submission looks like whether it be in the context of a marriage, whether it be the context of parenting, whether it be in the context of master-slave relationship. What does that look like? So a spirit-filled use of time. Avoid being filled with wine, Paul says. Drunkenness ruins your reasoning capabilities and makes you feel fuzzy. Instead, we are to be filled with the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? What does that look like? Before that question is answered, we need to be reminded of this important truth. Every believer, if they are genuinely born again, has the Holy Spirit. And that took place at the moment you believe. Paul said so in this very letter. Ephesians 1, 13 through 14, he says, In him you were also sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. When? When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed. When were you sealed with the Holy Spirit? When you believed. The Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the possession to the praise of his glory. Contrary to what some may say, one receives the Holy Spirit at belief. There aren't Christians walking around without the Holy Spirit to be filled later. It happens at the moment you believe. And so, I could elaborate a little bit more, and I may do so tonight, what the feeling of the Holy Spirit means here in Ephesians 5, and what it means in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost. There is a difference there. Difference in the Greek, difference in everything. And so what does it look like as Christians walk through their lives, being filled with the Holy Spirit? What does a church look like going through church life, filled with the Holy Spirit? Paul's not ambiguous, it's not mysterious, he says point blank, it's when you are speaking to one another in Psalms, the Psalms of the Bible. The Psalms of the Bible should discipline us, teach us how we are to write songs. Then we give in to hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making music with, hello, your heart to the Lord. Your entire being is to be given to the musical praise of God. Giving thanks also is indication that the Holy Spirit is at work in your church. Are you grateful for the things that the Lord has done for you? Are you singing his praises saying, thank you for life, thank you for marriage, thank you for family, thank you for jobs, thank you for healings, thank you for all of these things. And above all, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. If you are walking around thanking God for the goodness of the gospel, the Spirit is among you. Because no one who is filled with the Holy Spirit can curse Jesus. We are given praise to him. And lastly, another indication that the Holy Spirit is at work in you is that you're submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. Did you, did you know the church? This is a place where you come to serve. You know that, right? I talked about this last week. That this is a place you come to serve and not be served. If everyone is serving, you're going to get served. So don't worry about being left out. If everyone is taking care of each other, concerned about one another, no one is going to be left out. And so we are to be submitting to one another in fear of Christ. And again, if we continue this talk, it talks about wives submitting to their husbands by honoring their authority and respecting them. And husbands submitting to their wives by loving them sacrificially and leading them. And then it talks about how children are supposed to be obedient to their parents. That's children submitting to their parents. Slaves submitting. And so he elaborates on this. When all that is evident inside the church, that means the Spirit is at work among you. 
And so we got to make sure that we are not grieving the Holy Spirit. Now we might be asking the question you've been talking about, where, the Word of God. Where does that fit into this? Well, the answer is found in Paul's letter to the Colossians. Ephesians and Colossians have many similarities. If you ever read them back to back, they're considered brothers and sisters because they kind of uh, say the same thing. See for yourself, Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell richly among you in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. That's the Spirit working among you. I like what's said, regardless of what one may believe about the miraculous manifestations of the Holy Spirit, I believe that when Paul commands us in Ephesians 5.18 to be filled with the Spirit, he is commanding us to allow ourselves to be governed by the fullness of Christ in our lives. In Ephesians 5.18, the result of being filled with the Spirit are speaking in psalms, singing, giving thanks, and a harmony of relationships between husbands and wives, parents and children, masters and slaves. That's Max Anders' end quote. We are to be led by the Spirit of God through the entirety of our lives. Roman 8, Romans 8 makes it clear that those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. During extraordinary times, and yes, even in ordinary times, love and respect for each other is an indication that the Spirit is at work in a church. Folk says this, and I quote, Pride of position and the authoritarian spirit are destructive of fellowship. The importance to Paul, the whole concept of submission is evident from the use of the word more than 20 times in his epistles. We must be empty of pride if we are to be filled with the Spirit. D.L. Moody said this, and I quote, I believe firmly that the moment our hearts are emptied of pride and selfishness and ambition and everything that is contrary to God's law, the Holy Spirit will fill every corner of our hearts. But if we are full of pride and conceit and ambition in the world, there is no room for the Spirit of God. We must be emptied before we can be filled. End quote. Like Moody. Moody's sharp on this. This idea that perhaps the Spirit is not working in our lives, in our church, is because we have filled our hearts with other things that are in the way. Things that grieve the Holy Spirit. I remember one time I was at home, I made myself a cup of coffee, I had the Keurig, I just pulled out a mug from the cabinet, put it in the machine, hit the button, walked away, and then eventually I started smelling the smell of coffee, and it was time, coffee time, right? I was excited, and I went in there, and I proceeded to drink out of the cup. I was sitting there drinking it, drinking it, enjoying my coffee. When I was about halfway down, I noticed that there was still some goo in the cup. That somehow the cup made it through the dishwasher and that goo remained in the cup. Whoever put it in the cabinet did not see said goo. When I grabbed the cup down from the cabinet, I did not see that goo. And I attempted to fill the cup with wonderful, delicious coffee. But when I found out that it was filled with goo and other, uh, whatever it was, I still don't know what it is today. When I found out there was something abominable in my coffee cup while I was drinking it, I immediately spit it out. And I went to the sink and said, nah, back to the dishwasher with you cup. See, when we walk in darkness and our hearts are dirty and filled with things that ought not to be filled with, the Spirit is grieved. And, and we can't walk through life filled with His presence because other grotesque and abominable things have taken root in our hearts. Are we a Spirit-filled church? When we look at this test, cross-referencing Scripture with truth, are we a Spirit-filled church? Things that we need to be asking ourselves. Are the words of Christ, the words of God, being faithfully taught, not only taught, but received, not only received, lived out? If we can say yes to that, 
That's an indication that the Spirit is at work among us. Are we joyfully singing the gospel of Christ to each other? Enjoying these psalms, enjoying these hymns and spiritual songs. If we can say yes to that, then the Holy Spirit is at work with us. Are we about serving one another? Helping out with one another? Getting our hands involved in the ministry? In kingdom work? Are we eager to do that? Or we just like to sit and watch? If we are humbly serving one another with submissive hearts, then the Spirit of God is at work among us. This is something I can't just totally answer for everybody here in the room. It's not something I can totally answer for the church as a whole. I could sit there and say, outwardly, these things may be happening, but only God knows if these things are inwardly happening. You might sit in a Sunday school class, but are you genuinely humbling yourselves to the Word of God and walking out saying, the Word of God and I will do it. Are we joyfully singing? We might go through the motions. We might stand on cue. We might even mouth the words. But are they precious to us? And are we singing in such a way that we want our Father pleased in heaven? We might be even going through the motions of volunteering and helping with things. But are we doing it with submissive hearts out of love for one another? Or is it just to satisfy an itch or to build up your own little kingdom inside the church? These are questions we have to ask ourselves. These are questions I want to resonate in your heart as our musicians come. They are going to come to the altar or come and lead us in song. And what I'm going to do is invite you to come to the altar and pray about these things as well. That now with a proper understanding of Ephesians 5 and what it means to be filled with the Spirit, come to the altar and ask the Lord, fill me with the Spirit. Give me a servant's heart. Put the joy of Christ's teachings in my heart. Let me sing, let me be happy, let me dance because God is good. And give him all the thanksgiving. Use that at this time. Come to the altar. Roxanne, help us out, please.